Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Taking Things a Step Further, Strategic Planning for Alana Funding. My name is Sherilyn Seeley, Program Manager for Grantmakers in the Arts. Grantmakers in the Arts is a national association of public and private arts and culture funders. Our mission is to provide leadership and service that advances the use of philanthropic and governmental resources to support the growth of arts and culture. Last year, Tracy D. Hall, Program Director of Culture at the Joyce Foundation, Bushra Junaid, Outreach and Development Manager at Ontario Arts Council, and Dana Payne, Program Director at Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, joined us to discuss their efforts to close the racial gap in arts philanthropy through their respective programs. They are back again this year to discuss the various stages of their strategic planning process for providing support to Alana Arts Organizations. ALANA is an acronym which stands for African, Latinx, Asian, Arab, and Native American. Tracy D. Hall is the Program Director of Culture at the Joyce Foundation. Previously, she served as Deputy Commissioner of Chicago's Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, where she oversaw the arts and creative industries. Bushra Junaid manages the Ontario Arts Council's Skills and Career Development. This includes Indigenous Arts Professionals and Arts Professionals of Color programs and its Deaf and Disability Arts Projects program, among other equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives. Dana Payne is the Program Director for the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. She is responsible for the administration of grant programs for dance, folk, and traditional arts in the agency's nationally recognized Preserving Diverse Cultures Division. We are glad to have them present on this webinar. I'll be joining after the presentation to facilitate a Q&A. Before we start, a housekeeping note. Throughout the presentation, you can type questions to the presenters or myself into the rectangular box at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to get all of them during the Q&A. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. Welcome Tracy, Bushra, and Dana. Dana, why don't you kick us off? Thank you, uh, and thank you to Grantmakers for inviting me to uh, participate in this continuing discussion about Alana funding initiatives. Um, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts is a state agency in the office of the governor created by legislative act of the Pennsylvania General Assembly in 1966. We are governed by a 19-member council who represent constituencies throughout our 67-county state. Our mission is to foster the excellence, diversity, and vitality of the arts in Pennsylvania and to broaden the availability and appreciation of those arts throughout the state. Uh, we fulfill our mission through grants to the arts, partnerships and initiatives, technical assistance to partners and applicants, and serving as a resource for arts-related information. We offer funding opportunities through several divisions and programs, arts and education, PA partners in the arts, arts organizations and arts programming, entry track, folk and traditional arts, technical assistance and professional development, and preserving diverse cultures. So I'd like to provide a little background information about the Preserving Diverse Cultures Division. Uh, PDC began as the Minority Arts Program and was established in 1979 with support from the NEA Expansion Arts Program in response to requests from the field to address the lack of appreciation, knowledge of, and support for art forms reflective of Alana communities. Uh, for the first 10 years, the first funding opportunities were offered in the form of technical assistance grants to attend state and national arts conferences, an arts management fellowship program, and a related organizational development publication. Uh, the program also offered opportunities for exposure to organizations through annual performance showcases. Uh, after an evaluation of the services offered during the first 10 years, we sought to develop strategies to strengthen our commitment to the arts and cultural programming and identify challenges that were committed, that were contributing to the demise of cultural organizations 
and events in the Commonwealth's diverse communities. And as a result of that initial evaluation and subsequent annual evaluation, uh, elements of existing programs, such as uh, the Technical Assistance Program and the Fellowship in Arts Management Enterprise, were adjusted to better serve the field. Uh, as you can see, um, the names have changed just uh, a little bit on the right-hand side of um, the slide. And initiatives such as Strategies for Success and the Challenge Grant Program were initiated as pilots. Uh, Strategies for Success uh, was established in 1990. It's a three-level, multi-year capacity building grant program that addresses and supports organizational development for organizations, programs, and projects whose mission and artistic work are deeply rooted in and reflective of Alana Perspectives. Uh, a portion of the grant is allocated towards programming and artistic expenses, and a portion is allocated towards an organizational development consultant. Uh, Strategies for Success has grown over the years in response to the needs of the field. Uh, the Challenge Grant, which was offered between 2003 and 2012, was a transitional advancement program for eligible Strategies graduates uh, designed to promote organizational growth and stabilization through a large grant to support the planning and implementation of strategies to expand programming and increase fundraising capacity. Our current programs include Strategies for Success, a community-based engagement project grant which was designed for uh, artists and uh, organizations who are new uh, to uh, the funding process. Uh, the, we have virtual and in-person organizational development workshops, uh, technical assistance for artists and organizations, and a Preserving Diverse Cultures newsletter. Strategic planning responds to the changing needs of the field and addresses internal and external programs and processes that may need to be initiated and or amended to better serve the field and communities across our state, uh, while a formal strategic planning process takes place every four to five years. Internally, we evaluate our programs and services on an annual basis by maintaining a presence in the field and listening to the feedback that we receive. During the course of every program year, the division gathers information from the field in the following ways. Uh, I conduct many one-on-one uh, -on -one SWOT analysis-like meetings, help with board and staff of participating uh, strategies organizations, uh, obtain feedback from organizational development consultants who work with our organizations and artists, uh, general observations made through application review, site visits, uh, panel review, and conversations held in the field, uh, identifying best practices through uh, art service organizations and uh, conversations with colleagues who are committed to capacity building, and information gained at local and national convenings. Uh, this information gathering lets us know what's working and what's not and informs our consideration and plans for new initiatives and adjustments that need to be made to current programs. Uh, in addition, this information, along with feedback obtained uh, during the information gathering phase of our strategic planning process, helps to shape our goals looking forward and uh, outline in the final strategic plan. And that's where we are now. We are at the very beginning um, of our strategic planning process. We're at the information gathering phase. So we are currently engaged in conducting one-on-one -on -one interviews with community stakeholders across the state. Uh, we're getting ready to begin um, uh, staff interviews. Uh, we will be deploying an online survey directed towards our grantees, uh, our, our partners, and communities across the state, and then uh, in the upcoming months, we will hold community meetings and have focus groups uh, across the state. Uh, one of the things that I am uh, interested in is 
how Alana artists and art organizations have been impacted by the growing use of technology. Uh, technology is used in uh, grant making and fundraising, marketing, preserving, and creative art, and creating art. And I'm interested what the issues are uh, so far as uh, access to hardware, software, uh, whether or not there are any knowledge or capability capability issues, and uh, access to the internet, and um, exploring ways to address these issues. So thank you uh, again, and I will now turn it over to Tracy Hall of the Joyce Foundation. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much um, for uh, that great lead-in. Um, hi, everyone. I am really grateful to GIA and to all of you for um, having this opportunity to share the work we're continuing to do here at the Joyce Foundation to realize racial and economic diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice through our grant making. I'm going to be concentrating here on how we approach those tenets in the construction of a new strategic plan for the foundation overall, and specifically uh, per our needs today for the culture program. And so I have um, a lot of kind of uh, background um, that went into our thinking, real life issues that were um, coming to the fore um, in the Midwest and in Chicago, and then I'm going to do more of a deeper dive um, into where we actually ended up. So um, just to review um, for folks, and just in case, um, uh, we need a quick background on the Joyce Foundation. The foundation turned 70 this year, having been established in 1948 by Beatrice Joyce Keene. The foundation supports policy research, development, and advocacy in five areas, education and economic mobility, environment, gun violence prevention and justice reform, democracy, and culture. And Joyce focuses its grant is grant making in Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin, and partners with funders to explore promising policy solutions in other states or at the federal level. Uh, for 2018, the foundation has budgeted charitable distributions of about $50 million on assets of approximately $1 billion. Our investments, as, as I um, have mentioned, um, really focus around uh, investments in the Great Lakes area, in Illinois again, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Um, and our culture program um, does its deepest dive, of course, in Chicago, where we um, make the majority of our grants. But we also have Joyce Awards, which um, support the commissions um, of artists of color um, in the major um, met metropolitan cities in the five other states. Um, and so when we're working across the region um, like this, we see striking similarities in the sociopolitical migration and labor histories of these regions and of these states, especially um, in the metropolitan cities. And so I want to kind of um, talk a little bit um, about that here. I think, um, to be sure, the region, the Midwest, uh, is rightfully characterized by um, Midwestern values that everyone sort of talks about. And I brought this image from a local trucking company's website. Um, and I think that um, these words here kind of describe a regional character that as a native Californian, I truly admire and have um, come to count on. Um, it's clear. I think that similar things brought people to the Midwest from rural and urban communities across and outside the country, um, especially when we think about entry-level um, agricultural manufacturing jobs um, and light uh, industrial jobs, affordable housing, ethno-linguistically connected neighborhoods, artistic traditions like jazz and blues and uh, other things. But it's also clear that many of these things are in varying degrees uh, disappearing across uh, the Midwest. 
So simultaneously, um, this slide uh, from 2015 uh, from um, Kaiser found, Family Foundation study, CNN Kaiser Family Foundation study, shows that just as a hard work ethic and tight-knit communities have historically defined the Midwest, so has segregation. In fact, four of the six cities that Joyce invests in, Chicago, Cleveland, Milwaukee, and Detroit, frequently show up in uh, top five lists for the most racially and or economically segregated cities in the country. Even Martin Luther King and his extended stay in Chicago uh, working on the Poor People's Campaign before his death noted crippling de facto segregation and racism on in uh, the Midwest and in Chicago on par with what he experienced in the most extreme cities in the South. Again, here in this slide, um, which uh, depicts uh, the work of artist Tanika Johnson, a project that she's working on called the Folded Map Project, which features side-by-side -side comparisons of housing on the same street at exact north and south address coordinates um, in Chicago speak to inequitable access to quality education, um, affordable housing, livable wage jobs, and safe communities that has caused what we're seeing in the Midwest as a second wave of out-migration. The first wave, of course, was characterized by white flight, but this second wave is being created by um, the move of people of color especially working class uh, people of color, out of major cities and into the suburbs, or in some cases, back to the south or to their co countries of origin. origin. I think what's important for those of us um, who work in the culture space is that when this phenomena uh, fully takes root, um, and where we see gentrification today, we're also finding, finding Alana arts organizations placed in situations where the constituency they may be working with or for um, is th that they may be working work about or for is no longer their immediate audience. And I think that comes with its own string of um, vulnerability. And this uh, next slide, I really wanted to just speak to um, the impact um, that outward migration and resulting gentrification um, that's caused by social inequity, um, the impact it's ha having on our local arts landscapes. Um, and so this is not unique to Chicago, but just recently in Chicago, um, there has been um, the painting over or the displacement um, of art, um, which is connected to larger community displacement. So I'm going to read a few lines from the article that accompanied uh, this image that I have. Um, and it's from a local paper. And it says, in Chicago, with a swipe of a brush, uh, Pilsen's history was erased. And Pilsen is a largely was formerly Polish and Czech and is largely Mexican, Mexican-American community today. Gone is the colorful 1971 mural celebrating historic Mexican and Chicano figures, including Rudy Lozano, Frida Kahlo, Benito Juarez, and Cesar Chavez, and in its place is a bare gray wall that doesn't reflect the community that has made the Chicago neighborhood its home for the past few decades. Um, the shutdown um, uh, and the paint over were blows to the community, and on Tuesday night when this image was taken, the Pilsen Alliance hosted a visual called The Morning of Casa Atlan. Um, and so what we're seeing, I think, in some ways is um, a real change um, to the art assets that we observed um, and that were present for decades and decades uh, in Chicago. Um, and that's extremely, obviously, very concerning. And here, this headline um, from Cranes is just another um, such headline speaking to the population shifts we're experiencing. Residents, as I had mentioned, are leaving the area for better economic opportunities. And in this article, um, the writer observes that much of Chicago's um, current population loss comes from black residents leaving economically disinvested south side and south, south, and south suburban neighborhoods. So um, ultimately, in um, doing a lot of the background work that I think all of our portfolios were doing, ultimately, at some point in time in 2017, when we were in the throes of um, our strategic planning um, and, and being faced, of course, with um, not only population decline in some regions as we've spoken to, but also slow go growth in others, as well as shifting economic models that um, have, in some cases, displaced core groups of workers and, in other cases, whole communities. 
disease, at some point we, we all kind of came to this uh, question that was asked to us um, by our board as well. Um, in your planning, uh, ask the question, what makes someone want to live, work, create, or stay in the Great Lakes, Great Lakes region? So ultimately, uh, that faced with that question, um, it sort of led, uh, I think, me to a moment, and I'm always trying to find uh, songs. I am a music person, for, uh, really. Uh, so when I was planning this PowerPoint, I wanted to show the song that kind of came up um, to me. It's, it's two songs from 1978. I had no idea in my remembrance that um, they were from the same, not only the same era, but the same exact year. Uh, and um, these songs, uh, both made waves on the charts in 1978 um, by Sylvester and Cheryl Lynn. And I think both of them, in some ways, are intersectional in their connecting of queer, black, and working class economic migrant cultures. And this particular case, people who are still coming in to these communities that we're focused on at Joyce um, for better opportunities. And both of these songs made waves on the chart in 1978, the year that Harvey Milk, uh, who campaigned on a pro-gay rights platform, became San Francisco City Supervisor. Uh, and then also later that year would commission Gilbert Baker to make a symbol, an emblem, of, um, of gay pride that would uh, result in the first rainbow flag that was unveiled at a parade in 1978. And also is um, the same year that um, the Supreme Court hears um, one of its penultimate um, cases um, in which affirmative action is seen as reverse uh, discrimination, and that's uh, the Regents of the University of California versus Baki. Um, both, I think, um, of those uh, events um, really speak to this time in 2018, um, you know, where we're asking ourselves questions about what do we really mean, and here's a definition of real. Um, what do we really mean um, in grant making when we are being called on to be um, both genuine um, in reacting to our communities as they exist um, and also thinking about them um, in terms of the hard facts that are presented rather than supposition or imagination. Um, so ultimately there, um, using a definition of real, we move to um, the three focus areas then that um, our board uh, decided um, would guide the next three years of grant making for Joyce, and they are racial equity, economic mobility, and next generation leadership. And we know that in uh, Chicago, um, here is um, uh, infographic from the Telecon report, um, there is a gap um, in funding, especially to Alana organizations. And so there's quite a bit of work to do um, in this area. So where did that lead us? Um, in our um, strategic planning? Where did we decide to focus? We really wanted to think about um, the fact that most of the, mo the, the most nimble models of addressing key social issues and redistributing resources were being led by artists. So we, we wanted to note that and to learn from artists. And you'll see how that resulted, what that showed up for us later at. Um, and then also we were struck in the Midwest, across the Midwest, by the number of instances in which community stakeholders saw access to arts, both participation and making, as fundamental to their overall quality of life. And also, too, I'll um, just stop right here, that um, it meant also, too, that um, we needed uh, to focus on, to take a different focus, and I would say to focus more, uh, to move away from the philanthropic model when we thought about arts funding, and more to maybe even a public health um, or public benefits type of model. Um, and so I spoke to that a little bit in an article, and I was asked to mention it on this um, webinar um, that I wrote for GIA and the GIA Reader um, that you might want to check out. Um, it, it's called Culture as a Human Right, Building Sustainable Approaches to Arts and Humanities Funding. And in it, I'm speaking to the work that we're just in the midst of in this uh, year, 2018, uh, where Joyce has been co-convening almost 30 arts organizations with our partners 
partner Illinois Humanities to begin a comprehensive approach to arts planning uh, and support that anticipates new and public and private funding streams. So we're still uh, in the works uh, with that, uh, and so I will talk about that um, as it goes along. But again, um, I think um, as we move away from a traditional sort of philanthropy model um, to mo a model that um, is really thinking about arts as um, a human right and as a real infrastructure, we're, we move to a level of what I call strategic, strategic planning realness. So um, again, pulling on that trope of to be real or mighty real. I am going to now go through where we um, have ended up uh, with our strategic planning. So this is the result of the planning that we did for about 11 months um, over in the overarching foundation, and then finally how that's shown up for us in um, the culture program. So um, here is our mission to inspire creativity and cultural stewardship and the next generation of Great Lakes residents by strengthening the role of artists. So again, artists being the operative as well as arts organizations in fostering culturally vibrant, equitable, and sustainable communities. So we ended up with three focus areas, access and participation, arts leadership and workforce, and finally, creativity and cultural production. I'm going to focus a little bit on arts access and participation here and give an example and then move through the other two focus areas um, before I end. Um, our goal here with arts access and participation was really to expand access to high quality arts programming and meaningful arts participation in underserved communities where limited opportunities currently exist. And by limited opportunities in, say, Chicago, for instance, uh, where we have 295 or so 501c3 theaters, we only have two theaters um, on the south and west side altogether. And that's where the greatest part of the population lives and the majority of the POC or Alana community lives. So we really wanted to focus here on access um, and also instruction, um, but not necessarily just K through 12 instruction, but community instruction, instruction for adults, et cetera. One of uh, the grants that we made early was for the first time to support one of our Joyce Award uh, winners, um, the playwright Ricardo Gamboa, um, in not only uh, staging a play, Meet Juanito Do, with an all uh, Latinx cast, and with the primary goal of reaching a majority Latinx community, but we also supported um, the creation of the Storyfront Theater in which uh, Gamboa rented out a former appliance store in the back of the arts neighborhood, which is a largely Latino neighborhood where there are no theaters, and not only set the, um, obviously, the play around Latinx themes, but used a Latinx access point um, and on the main thoroughfare in the community to make the first theater. So not uh, there, not only did we fund uh, the commission of the play and the production of the play, we also funded, um, and you see it here on the right, we also funded another year of operations before the Storyfront Theater um, as it is becoming. Our goal is not necessarily that it, you know, is a theater for 30 years, but for us to learn and for Gamboa, a talent like Ricardo Gamboa, to learn what it means to operate um, a community curated and community led theater in a largely Latino community. We're also partnering with the School of the Art Institute to support a new cultural heritage institution leadership development, which will be focused on supporting um, professionals within cult cultural heritage centers and galleries um, and cultural centers, et cetera, who may not have had previous um, uh, arts administration exposure to give them not only a sort of uh, boot camp um, in training everything from uh, the registrarial level to um, administration and development, but then to also give them, um, as, as a result of that, for them to get credit um, in arts administration um, from the school, which is considered to be, I think, in the top three um, of art schools nationally. So it was important for us not for them only to have access, but for them to have um, a credit from the school, uh, further validating um, you know, their learnings there. 
Our focus area two, arts leadership and workforce. Our goal here was to continue our work um, in supporting um, a more diverse and equitable pipeline, an inclusive pipeline of arts administrators, but also to begin to think more about sector employees, especially um, creative uh, sector employees that may not necessarily um, have a higher education degree um, or who may have faced um, you know, chronic un underemployment. So the goal here is not just to focus on arts administrators administrators, but also to extend that support um, to work with people who can work in the technical aspects um, of the art sector and learn trades um, and learn skills and trades um, that will allow them to be employed for a long time at a livable wage. And I can certainly talk more than, that, than uh, I am if there's any questions about um, those programs. Um, there. But here's an example of work with um, the Goodman Theater on racial equity in theater administration and production. Here are just four participants um, who have gone on to full-time jobs, or in one particular case, um, to an MFA um, in technical design and production, and the others who are now um, active and on the scene as um, emerging arts leaders. So not only was this an exposure type of program with Goodman Theater, it led to long-term um, and full-time employment. Um, and here, um, we're really proud of uh, the partnership with Independent Curators International to diversify museum and gallery leadership. And here are just three, uh, three leaders that have been supported um, through Joyce's uh, partnership with ICI. Um, and um, these three uh, curators have each gone on, again, to very visible um, and to full-time employment um, in organizations of note locally um, as well across the country. Um, I can't uh, talk, um, I can't say another word without talking about Enrich, which my predecessor, Angelique uh, Power, um, co-developed with arts leaders in Chicago that is specifically working on um, an equitable local arts landscape. And so Enrich has grown now. There are so many case studies being written. There's so much more I could say about Enrich. But we continue our support of, of Enrich, which is really to have the kind of conversation that we're having today um, strategically across Chicago, and I think it's a model that the rest of the country could certainly um, you know, listen to and, and, and other people doing similar things could really kind of link up uh, with a lot more to say about Enrich, but I think that there are, Enrich will be the subject of a future conversation in a GIA webinar or um, publication. Our last focus area is creativity and cultural production. <clears throat> so in addition to our Joyce Awards, each year we um, make three to five awards um, which arts organizations and community organizations can commission um, artists of color of note to address issues and uh, to find opportunities that are resonant within specific geographies. In addition to that work, we've expanded to, um, all, and we've always supported artists, um, especially artists of color as problem solvers, which I'll talk about, but we're also expanding that to cultural production and thinking about how do we generate more arts journalism and more arts criticism that feature and center work by artists of color. Um, two um, different um, pieces of work that we've engaged in this year is um, a series, a question that will take us through the next three years, particularly about the role of the artists as problem solvers. What role do artists play in addressing, and we know they play a really important role, but this goes beyond social practice, but to the degree to which artists are showing up um, as uh, de facto or um, you know just planning uh, and planners in their community we really want to make sure that we um, that we honor that and here in Indiana we had a program in which we um, kicked it off and we invited 300 um, I'm sorry 150 people uh, artists and uh, planners and place keepers as well as placemakers um, into that conversation. And um, in, with Amanda Williams, we also um, have supported her work, a local artist architect who's interested in social enterprise and who made um, a name for herself and her work when she began to take over abandoned uh, houses um, overnight and paint them colors that she sourced from the local landscape to pay attention
attention to the fact that there was blight in um, Inglewood that could be um, uh, intervened upon, um, you know, by other by the city and other forces if they chose to. And she really got a lot of attention. And we also supported her at the Venice Biennale um, on the right, in which she was commissioned to make work for the. Um, um, U.S. Pavilion. I'm going to stop here um, and thank you all, and um, I look forward to any questions for myself and my co-presenters, and I'm going to pass it on to Bushra. So thank you very much, Tracy and uh, Dana and uh, Grantmakers in the Arts uh, for inviting my participation in this webinar. Um, Oh, here we are. Uh, so I'm Bush Richard I'm uh, Outreach and Development Manager with the Ontario Arts Council, uh, located in the uh, City of Toronto in Ontario, Canada. And uh, as we begin all of our work, we like to acknowledge the diversity of the first peoples of this area, uh, which we call Takaronto, and honor the stewardship of the Huron Windat, the Iroquois Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. My uh, presentation today is going to focus on three areas, OAC's uh, pre previous uh, strategic planning process and uh, how our equity and strategic plans overlap and how we report on our strategic uh, plan. So just a little bit of a uh, context or reminder for those uh, or information for those who might not have been on the previous uh, webinar with uh, Dana, Tracy, and myself, um, of who the Ontario Arts, Arts Council, or OAC for short, is. Uh, we're an arm's length agency of the government of the province of Ontario in Canada, uh, which is something like the government at the state level in a U.S. context. We're publicly funded uh, through taxpayer dollars through the Ministry or Department of Tourism, Culture, and Sport. We recently received a funding increase from our current base of $60 million uh, Canadian dollars uh, to 80 million by 2021, uh, uh, confirming the value of public funding in the arts. Uh, and though we receive government funding, uh, decisions uh, about grants and funding are made by peer assessment panels of artists, arts administrators, and arts community members that reflect the diversity of art practices, disciplines, and people across the province. OAC supports arts activity through four funding streams creating and presenting, building audiences and markets, engaging communities and schools, and developing careers and art services. Um, OEC um, launched its uh, current uh, strategic plan, Vital Arts and Public Value, a blueprint for uh, 2014 to 2020, in October 2014. Vital Arts and Public Value encapsulates two sides of OAC's mandate, which is to serve both the arts community and the public. Vital Arts and Public Value builds on the work that began with OAC's two previous strategic plans, Connections and Creativity, which was 2008 to 13, and Stability and Strength from 2003 to 2006. Work on our uh, current strategic plan began in the spring of 2013 with an environmental scan, and that was followed by an online questionnaire uh, uh, that was sent out to 2,800 people, including individual artists, organizations receiving operating or organizational grants from OAC, other funders, and stakeholders in the arts. The survey covered a variety of topics, including the key needs and issues facing the arts sector, those that OAC should address, OAC's roles, uh, the appropriate focus of OAC's activities, an exploration of public value, and OAC's goals over these next uh, six years. A total of uh, 1,858 1, individuals responded to the survey, uh, and that resulted in about uh, 1,460 completed questionnaires. And this was followed by a, uh, a one-day focus group session with 50 people to probe more deeply into key themes that emerged from the survey. Focus, focus groups included um, each of OAC's existing priority groups and a couple of others, so a new generation artists, uh, deaf artists and artists with disabilities, senior artists, artists of color and indigenous artists, 
uh, regional artists, so those are artists outside of Toronto, and our uh, organizations that are receiving operation operating uh, grants. The findings from um, our environmental scan, the survey, and our focus group session are pro uh, provided in um, a summary of external consultation phase, which is available on our website if you're interested in reading further. Uh, it's clear from the number of individuals who took the time to complete the online survey or participate in the focus group session that people really care deeply about the arts in Ontario and about OAC. Uh, the respondents and, and participants included a, uh, including a diverse mix of artists, arts organizations, and others from across the province shared uh, their candid views about what OAC might consider addressing or fulfilling over the next six years. Uh, their thoughtful opinions, responses, and ideas really helped to shape um, OAC's strategic plan. And so informed by these consultations, OAC's board and staff then participated in several facilitated sessions over the fall and winter of 2013-14. And our entire uh, process culminated in the writing of Vital Arts and Public Value, a blueprint for 2014 to 2020, the published plan, which you can find on our website. So um, OAC serves multiple communities in an increasingly uh, diverse province. And just uh, so you know, about 51% of, um, sorry, about a fifth of, Can of Canada's population was born outside of the country. And, and when you look at the city of Toronto, uh, about 51% of, or just over half of our residents uh, in, were born outside of Canada. So, um, our pop, the population in Ontario uh, has increased um, about 5.7% uh, since 2006. So the current population is up, up about 13 million people. And our indigenous populations are increasing um, uh, significantly with uh, uh, the First Nations population having increased 32% uh, from uh, 2006 to 2011, the Métis population 17 percent, and the Inuit population 65 percent. So an increasingly diverse um, country and province. Um, and so as a public f uh, agency funder and employer, the Ontario Arts Council is committed to access and equity. By this we mean uh, treating people fairly and taking into account and accommodating different barriers and needs so that all groups and communities can have access to opportunities and resources. Uh, systemic barriers and regional disparities in the art sector require us to develop an equity lens that uh, regards our decision making. So um, OAC has introduced programs, policies, and procedures throughout its history that support equity, diversity, and inclusion. Included in our current plan, um, is our equity plan, which outlines specific objectives OAC is committed to achieving in order to address and remove barriers uh, in our programs, processes, and services. We also have a multi-year accessibility plan and um, have accommodation policies for applicants and assessors using, using OAC's uh, new online uh, grant application system. OAC's commitment to ensuring equitable access to all Ontarians emphasizes um, what we call, uh, what I've mentioned, uh, our priority groups, which kind of align with the Atlanta groups, representing particular equity-seeking communities. Um, and I'll speak a little bit more about that in a minute. So peer assessment is really an important principle and practice for OAC. We strive to ensure that our assessment panels represent the range of applications received for a funding program uh, deadline and reflect the diversity of the province. We instruct all of our assessors to adhere to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Ontario Human Rights Code when considering access, opportunity, and impact in funding applications, and also who has the right to tell these stories. Uh, for example, where two applications are equally scored, the one from a priority group, artist or organization, is funded. So our priority groups are, um, uh, we have six of them, uh, artists of color, 
deaf artists and artists with disabilities, francophone artists, which rec recognize um, our francophone heritage in Canada, indigenous artists, uh, recognizing both customary and contemporary art forms, and the extraordinary contribution of indigenous artists to our cultural landscape, escape in, in spite of the historical and ongoing legacies of colonization. Uh, which have created social and economic challenges in indigenous communities. New generation artists, as I mentioned, 18 to 30 years old. And um, because the city of Toronto has a large population and high concentration of artistic activity and wanting to ensure um, equitable access for artists across the province, artists living anywhere outside of Toronto are also considered a priority. Uh, for the Ontario Arts Council. So some of our priority groups have a unique history, identity, and status in Canada. Some have faced historical or systemic barriers. Others reflect uh, the province's, uh, our province-wide mandate, and all are essential to the future of the arts sector. OAC acknowledges that there are intersections uh, be uh, between and amongst priority groups, as well as the uh, diversity within each of these categories. There are certainly other population groups that, in Ontario that face barriers. Uh, however, these are the, the, the groups that we have, um, have uh, committed to focusing on at this time. And uh, it will be interesting to see what, uh, what uh, emerges in our, uh, our upcoming uh, strategic plan uh, process. So um, I've, on this slide, we've shown some of uh, OEC's designated uh, funding programs. Uh, of course, uh, artists from priority groups are, uh, may apply to any OEC funding uh, program, but we also have a, a few uh, designated funding uh, programs or, uh, or uh, units uh, at, here at Ontario Arts Council that offer specific forms of support. Uh, some for, uh, programs are discipline specific, uh, such as in visual arts or dance. Some are multidisciplinary. Uh, we also have a francophone arts office, an indigenous arts office, each of which has a whole suite of programs and staff, and outreach staff in the northern part of uh, northern, both the northeast and northwest of Ontario. Um, I manage uh, two designated funding programs. Uh, one is for uh, deaf artists and artists with disabilities. And uh, I also manage a professional development program for Indigenous arts professionals and arts professionals of color. Uh, the Deaf and Disability Arts Project program supports Ontario-based artists and arts organizations that are led by deaf artists and or art artists with disabilities. And it supports funding, produ uh, production, or professional development, as well as the purchase of materials and supplies to make visual arts or craft work. And uh, this is a, was a program that was introduced in, in 2015, so we've had um, three funding uh, deadlines since the program was introduced, and the, the demand is increasing uh, precipitously <laughs> or incrementally, incrementally. So the Indigenous arts uh, professionals, arts professionals of color um, uh, may be uh, confronted with a lack of infrastructure and resources to develop their careers, including opportunities for coaching, mentorship, uh, skills development, professional development, connecting with uh, presenters, networking or developing formal networks, and few of any artist-run centers and organizations established to serve them. Uh, one of OAC's strategies for addressing this was the launch of the Skills and Career Development uh, formerly Access and Career Development Program in 2006 to support uh, cultural diversity of Ontario's art sector through study or training, mentorship, internship, and portfolio development or documentation of existing artwork. The program offers project funding and is open to emerging mid-career and senior artists and collectives from all disciplines and practices. And uh, it could serve as an, a critical entry point to funding at the OEC and uh, as a port, an important function in outreaching to indigenous communities and communities of color, including newcomer artists, social service agencies, Im immigrant services, and new arts organizations. And since its inception in uh, 2006, uh, 77 arts professionals have been funded for a total of approximately $5 million.
So um, I also just actually wanted to just go back. I want to touch on um, an important program that um, supports um, uh, assists arts managers with professional development and assists arts organizations um, in terms of building administrative and uh, management capacity in the arts. And uh, of course, many uh, of our priority uh, group organizations or Atlanta organizations um, look to that program for for uh, support. There are four categories. Um, and the program is called Compass. It's the last one listed on the slide. Uh, so there's there are four categories. One is organizational development to help cover the cost of planning uh, uh, for organizations in uh, organizational capacity building. Uh, category two supports um, professional development for arts managers to help cover the cost of activities that will help to build their capacity uh, as individuals in any area of arts management. We also, um, category three offers micro grants, professional de uh, development for arts managers to help cover the cost of courses, seminars, workshops, conferences, et cetera, in any area of arts management. And finally, there's um, a category four, arts management internships that help cover costs of internships for arts managers who um, come from those priority groups, so indigenous, of color, deaf, and or uh, disabled. So how do we um, report on our strategic plan? Uh, we report on a uh, we report on the plan through our business plan, uh, which we submit each year to our board of uh, directors and, uh, and the government. And in, in addition, OAC's uh, performance uh, measures framework directly re relates to the goals of our strategic plan. So um, our perform OAC's performance measures include rep reporting on our level of support of priority groups. And this includes in designated funding programs and across all of our funding programs as, at OEC. That, so we thought, saw that as important to include as, a, as, as, as a, a performance measure in and of itself. And diversity and inclusion in OEC's applications and funding is one of our performance measures. Uh, as well, we use a voluntary self-ID um, process in order to track our performance on these measures. Our performance measures framework, um, as, as our first, as our first uh, step in that framework, we developed a, a logic model that can, will help us to see how our activities were contributing to public value for, in terms of short and midterm outcomes uh, through to long-term impacts on Ontario's economy, society, and culture. And um, we also uh, look at this in terms of uh, and we measure this annually and report on it annually. And this also helps to further guide our decisions and build our understanding about how our OEC is achieving its goals. And by collecting our performance uh, measurement data on our short-term goals, uh, we gain evidence about our progress and contributions to our longer-term and impacts. Um, we update, update uh, these measures annually uh, to track results across all of our indicators and our targets on each of our measures. So we, we, look, we can look at the percentage of applications coming from any, um, from artists and arts organizations, for example, who identify as artists of color, as deaf artists and artists with disabilities, um, Francophone, indigenous, or new generation, or from outside of Toronto. So we're looking at the number, the percentage of applications received. And then we can also look at the percentage of funding that's actually um, going um, to those uh, priority groups. So I think that's where I'm going to end it, um, so that we have uh, room time for uh, the Q&A. Uh, so over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And over to you, Sherilyn. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bushra, Dana, and Tracy. That was a great presentation from all of you. And it was great to learn about the different stages of the strategic planning process, from the initial information gathering stage all the way to the end, to the review and reporting stage. So 
for the Q&A, we've got time for a few questions. And any questions that we don't get to now, you can just type them into the box, and we'll make sure that they go to the appropriate um, presenter. So just be sure to address your question to a specific presenter if necessary. Um, so we have one question in already from um, Kathy. And she asks, this is just kind of generally to the presenters, can you talk about some of the pros and cons of your funding sources, private versus public, if there's a different kind of accountability you can talk more about? So maybe both a few of you can jump in, because I know um, we've got public and private represented here. So. This is Dana. Um, so we are a uh, publicly funded agency, and our budget is determined uh, every year um, when the uh, the budget is finalized. And um, so, for the past few years, our budget has uh, remained the same, but it uh, we've been affected by uh, deep cuts. Uh, we've had a budget. We've once had a budget. Um, of uh, uh, close to sixteen million dollars. Uh, now it is uh, down to nine. Uh, we've had uh, a reduced staff. Um, so it, it, you know, every year uh, we sort of know what our budget is going to be uh, going forward. But you know, it's always it, it's never uh, one hundred percent. So um, uh, that's why these uh, these strategic planning processes. Uh, are so important so that we can uh, really develop good methods of uh, using the money that we have allocated uh, wisely. And I would say it's the same here with the Ontario Arts Great. Council where our funding is we're entirely publicly funded. And so um, it, we, it, I would give exactly the same response. Okay. Tracy, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, well, um, you know, Joyce, um, being uh, the type of funder it is, is, uh, you know, private. And, you know, I've worked, of course, um, you know, relying on public funds and private funds as well. I think that, you know, really the, at this particular point, I think that the strategies are ultimately the same, although I think I've tried to hint in my presentation that I feel like sometimes in the arts we stay too narrowly in, in the arts box. I think that a lot of our work is at the intersection um, you know, of um, other uh, concerns um, and that I think the arts is really a canopy that covers so much. And so public safety, um, infrastructure planning, um, definitely when it comes to just Department of Transportation, juvenile justice, um, the justice system in general, public health, et cetera. So I do think sometimes that, um, you know, one thing that uh, I would want to leave with, with folks from my own experience is that a lot of our strategies as they intersect the larger world, um, we should be thinking about expanding our funding, uh, our, our, our thinking too, and expanding our funding pools. Great. Um, so I'm going to ask one more question. This is for you, Tracy. And uh, Dana and Bushra, you can jump in as well if you've got anything to add. But how have you responded to other organizations and stakeholders who feel that there's a difference between funding to ensure diversity and funding to further excellence in the, in the discipline? That's wonderful. Thank you for that uh, question because we get that, you know, I think that that's probably something that is happening, um, you know, in the field, um, not only in arts, but just as um, in uh, philanthropy as uh, we begin to think about social justice more broadly and frankly there's more demand um, that uh, philanthropy uh, you know takes the issue up and also shows leadership in that area I think you know for me that's sort of a false choice to ask um, you know if there is um, a difference for uh, between funding for diversity and funding for excellence you know implies too much much more than I would want to go to, into here I think um, the thing though that we want to understand is that the art sector has been really slow to 
move in terms of leadership uh, positions and even on its canon um, in terms of who and what and what types of art form and what types of artists are centered. And so I do think that we have to double down in that area if we're going to progress and if also we're going to make our organizations and the work that we show resonant. Because really I think in a lot of ways our audiences are voting with their feet. And so. Um, you know, that question of excellence and quality, and then that qu question of diversity for me, I think in places like Chicago and the Great Lakes, and certainly I know on the coast, is an easy answer to that, because um, some of the artists who are making the best work also rec uh, represent our full diversity in the country. Great. All right, so we are at the end of our time for questions and for our presentation, but I just want to thank the three of you again, Tracy, Bushra, and Dana, for sharing. Uh, today's presentation has been recorded. And so we'll be sending you all the link to that file and the presentation slides within the next day or two, along with a brief survey that we hope you will take a few minutes to fill out. Your feedback is always important to us, and it helps us to design future webinars. And then if you'd like the opportunity to flip through the slides now, we switched over the slide controls to you. And the slides will be up for the next hour or two. So you can always reach out to me as well if you have questions as you're going through the slides. And feel free to continue dropping your questions for our three presenters in the Q&A box to the bottom of your screen. And just be sure to direct them to a specific presenter. And with that, thank you so much for joining us. And I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.